Eric Roberts, Eliza Roberts, and the one and only Paul McGann. Simply, it was an exciting but daunting few weeks, um, and a shot in the dark. You know, we just didn't. I, I think, all things considered, I don't think we honestly thought that it would. It's a pilot. You know, we, we, the ch your chances are slim. You know, of getting made. So we just tried to enjoy it. I think. I know I did. Um, it might. It, it might have been just a one-off, and for a few years, of course, it was. Um, that was the memory. But just it was. It was a good time. It was a really good time. I felt nervous, you know, as you do for a little while. Um, but then, actually, I still do. I'm terrified. It's <laughs> actually a terrifying prospect. No, I had a good time though. I remember the cold. It was cold. All right, Eliza. Well, I guess your abiding thoughts about the TV movie. Well, about about making it or about it, the finished product. Oh, okay, I think it, the finished product was great. I, I loved the cast and I loved the humor and everything. I thought it was really good. Um, we loved our director. We loved each other, and being in Canada was fun. It was cold, but you should be used to cold, right? And, um, <laughs> uh, it was a really positive experience. And I remember the wrap gift was fun. What was the T-shirt? What did we do? I that. What was remember? That? It was something good. I don't remember. Yeah, no, it was something good. I can't remember either. All the t-shirts said you've been in a movie with Eric Roper. <laughs> <laughs> did you know tons and tons about Doctor Who before you did it? No. You didn't know tons and tons. I knew more than Daphne Well, yeah. <laughs> and you knew nothing. She needed nothing. Okay. But yeah, did you know anything about it? Uh, pretty close to, I was a little closer to Daphne than, than <laughs> Eric knew more than, you yeah. know. But yeah, no, it was a bit of a shot in the dark. I was going to say, I think you were telling us yesterday, you were basically given four days to cram in 35 years worth of history. Yes, that was very daunting. We got cast at the last minute, and, um, it, you know, we had no idea. We, and even the, the internet wasn't what it is today, either. Well, they had launched Olivia originally cast to play the master, yeah. but he got busy. <laughs> so, Eric, what's your, I guess, your thoughts on the final product now, thinking back, you know, after 19 years? It holds up. For the Doctor Who series, this one for me, I'm, I'm biased, naturally, but this one for me holds up the best because of him. Because he's so like <laughs> like he's involved in this weirdness, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, was cool. it was weird. I was waiting for the catch down there, you know that? There's <laughs> <laughs> always a hammer blow at the end. There. Thank you. 
I think it holds up as well. I think uh, I can see why. I mean, quite honestly, I can see why now. What I, I mean, I just looked through the codes and saw ten minutes of it, and I can see why people back then were perhaps disconcerted by it. Fans, you know, old fans of it, because uh, it wasn't what they were used to. You know, so it was divisive, and you can see why. You know, let's be honest about it. It wasn't. Uh, it looked. It looked. It was what it was. It looked expensive, uh, and different. But it's, it, you're right, it's held up, you know, it's, it's part of it. Thanks to you, pal. Thank you. Oh, how sweet of you. I mean, Paul, it was your only outing as the Doctor, at least on screen, for, you know, the better part of, you know, what, 16, 17 years? Yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> it was. And I thought that would be it, yeah, exactly, it was just that, that, that would be the end. But, um, so, you know, we tried to make it count, yeah. Um, it was, how long was the shoot? Maybe five, six weeks, that was it. And it was over, it was middle of winter, so it was over. Do any of you remember what the reactions were at the time? I mean, did you meet people at the time and they were like, I loved it, I hated it, what were you thinking when you did this? I remember reading reviews. I mean, most actors say they don't, but they, they eventually do. Um, you see them. Um, some of the reviews are okay, back in Europe, some were okay, some were quite lukewarm, uh, a bit baffled, some were very enthusiastic. Um, because I think, for, I think for the reviewers and fans alike, it was hard to, you couldn't, it wasn't a standalone thing. Um, and they couldn't judge it on its own single merit. Um, uh, and of course, it was only five or six years since the series had been stopped anyway. Right. So there was, not a, there was not a feeling about it. But, I think people have been kinder, and I think quite right, kinder to it since, um, as it's kind of taken its place, and as you know, as the distance grows between now and then, I think people feel better disposed to it. But at the time, there was um, there was some anti-feeling at the time, you know, absolutely. But then I think it had a, a really difficult. I think the, the fairest thing probably to say is that it, it had a difficult trick to pull off. Yeah. You know, it was, it was designed chiefly to locate and appeal to a new audience in North America while not putting the noses out of joint of all of these diehards and fans that had lived with it for 30 odd years back home. Right. And that was a, tr a tricky one to pull off. So, you know, a lot of the iconic things were present and correct, um, you know, in deference to the old fans, but it had a kind of sheen and a shyness and perhaps you know, uh, an Americanness that uh, traditionalists didn't like. But then, you know what, that's Doctor Who, isn't it? That's the Doctor Who family. That still goes on today. And, um, and there, were t you know, there were small elements in there, you know, bits of dialogue that the Doctor might have said, say, for example, about his being half human, and then the stuff about kissing the girl. <laughs> Silly stuff. But yep. It's stuff, you know, you guys are always going to argue about these things. And I think that's... <laughs> well, it's true. But it's part of it, you know, that's, uh, that's half of the sort of the dynamism. But I think it worked. It uh, worked. Yeah, it I worked met, for me. I met Phil Collinson, who was one of the producers on the new series a few years ago at a convention, and he made the comment that the kiss basically shocked the fans enough that when the new series came back, they could do, they could do it and get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask uh, Eric and Eliza, I mean, did you, I know Eric, you talked yesterday that you, I think it was somebody, you had a friend of yours who was English who watched it at the time and who gave his reaction to you about it. I mean... No, I have no English French. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. It's a twindling thing, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, it's not what I said at all. I said, uh, when, when I was in school in England, I got hit for Doctor Who. Right. But uh, it was so campy, I wasn't really ever interested in it. And then when they offered it to me, uh, I said, can I play it realistically? And they said, yes. And uh, uh, I followed his lead to playing it real. Yeah. I think that it's kind of like um, Shakespeare. They, they, I, remember, I grew up in New York, and I remember <laughs> Richard Burton's production of Hamlet. They wanted it accessible, as you said, to a younger audience. So there were no sets, it was just set pieces in black, and everybody wore black jeans and a black t-shirt. They really tried to make the language accessible, and they wanted to be more like what we watched on TV. And um, 
there were, of course, there's big controversy, as you said, because because some people were like, to go with tradition. I think that we, I think it's interesting that over time it's become more acceptable what we did, and that it's kind of good to straddle both because you do want to bring it to a new audience, but part of what you want to bring to a new audience is the old stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Works the same in, you know, in other art forms as well. It's, it's always going to happen, isn't it? You can't please everybody. Um, and it's certainly not in this room. You can't please everybody in this room. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. It's, it's actually a more valid question for you guys because you're real aficionados. And, but it's so great that there would be a desire to maintain tradition. Because think about it. You've got kids now who can't tie shoelaces or read a clock. They certainly have never used a typewriter. And you know they don't write anything down with the pencil either, so it's a whole other thing. And yet, on the other hand, it used to be that only girls could type at all, and now everyone can type. And you know, there's a lot of there's a lot to be said said about tradition and advancement. And Doctor Who, the fact that it stays alive is just genius. It's amazing. Great. Yeah, I've, I've heard it argued. I'm one of the people who's argued it. The TV movie really is the bridge between the old series and the new series. Yes. <laughs> but I think it's arguable that without it, we may never have had a series in 2005. Maybe. Maybe. I, I, I think, I, I mean, all of us have took part in it. Um, I think can feel satisfied about that at least. You know, that we, we, we kept it going. We are the bridge. We are the bridge. <laughs> in the wilderness here. <laughs> but you know, I mean, don't forget in the 60s, uh, you know, there was a movie made, uh, a cinema movie made with yeah, Peter Cushing. Cushing. So, you know, Doctor Who already had form, as we say in England. You know, there had already been these arguments about what is canon, what's not, what's allowed, what is, who's in, who's out. So, and in a way, the, 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 the TV movie in the 90s, played into that kind of thing as well. You know, there was a chance that it might actually be frozen out. Yeah. I remember, you know, people talking yeah, talk about Yeah, Russell it. T. Davies uh, did a series before Doctor Who. I remember you talked about this when I saw you in Chicago a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, which, understandably, had a character in the show that was a Doctor Who fan, and your name got mentioned, and the guy went, doesn't count. That's and right. I remember you saying you thought that was official policy for a long time. Well, yeah. But you never know with Doctor Who fans, you know. But, but, but uh, you know, the fact that it existed, I mean, the, the, the fact that it had happened before, it could easily have happened again. Right. Um, but we're glad it didn't, you know. But, but 96, 97, you know, the fans could easily, and, and the people that even that ran it, Russell T, when he took over the, the new series, could easily have just ignored it. Right. Um, right. But they didn't, thankfully. Because right, gonna... otherwise there'd be four empty chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, That's how I feel. <laughs> well, we probably wouldn't be here right now. So. Exactly. Would well, you be here on your own, pal? <laughs> probably because I am a sad, strange little man. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> All right, I think we're going to open up some questions. Yeah, you. let's see what you got to say. Um, this is a courted mic, so you're going to have to come to me, I'm afraid, uh, because the court is not very long. But I'm going to start with you if I can get the court to you. Do you, want, do you want to use the one these other Yeah, I'm a cordless mic. Okay, we'll yeah. do that then. And I'll take that one. Okay. There you go. Cool, well done. <laughs> I was trying to be nice and let the guests have the wireless mic, so. Hi, guys. I know the. Uh, 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 Jason's not here to put on the spot, unfortunately, but as clever as the writers of Big Finish are, it seems to me there's an opportunity to somehow revive the master who's trapped in the Eye of Harmony and bring him back. Eric, would you be open to working for Big Finish and doing a, perhaps a trilogy with uh, Paul's doctor? In a New York minute, but... Yeah! You have to ask. You have to ask my manager. Or... <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's official. Hi, guys. Y'all look great. Um, I was just wondering... What's the lighting? <laughs> and in fact, you're dashingly handsome. Um, <laughs> now, I was wondering, um, mainly for Eric and you, Paul, um, Eliza, I know you were in the movie, you looked stunning in a nightgown, but um, I was wondering how much influence, if any, did y'all have on your costumes for the movie? None. 
no influence on him. No, it was strict. It was really strict. Uh, I mean, at least as far as I was concerned. Um, no, no, they were. And because, of course, it was a pilot, they thought that, you know, they, like I was just saying, there was. They, they had to. They felt compelled to get it right. You know. Um, I think the only there's a sequence. There's a tiny sequence in there where he's once he's out of that. He's out of the fridge and he's beginning to find clothes to wear. I think you see him pick a scarf, or there's a scarf. Yeah. That was the only thing that I managed to, the only concession that I managed to get. I said, I don't want to wear this scarf. Good one. Really? But they were, just because I didn't want to wear it. Um, so uh, you, I think you see him actually put it back, but otherwise, nothing. Uh, you wear this, wear that wig, wear that coat, it's got to be this color, got to be that. They were strict. Um, you can see why. But what about you? What about you? It was like an old-fashioned costume fitting. The actor says nothing. <laughs> we're, we're just mannequins. And mm -hmm. like uh, my, uh, my dressed-up thing when I say, I always dress for the occasion. <laughs> you know, I weighed 65 pounds. <laughs> it was incredibly uncomfortable. Now, Paul, you've had a couple of additional costumes. There was one made for you by the Wiener Workshop in New Zealand that you, was used on the cover for Big Finish's Dark Eyes. Oh, yeah, yeah. You had the new costume made for Night of the Doctor. Do you have a favorite amongst those three? You know what? The Night of the Doctor one is my favorite. Yeah. Only because, um, again, I had no influence in that either, but uh, I think it, the thing I like about it most is it looks like it's been in the wars. Yeah. Literally been in the wars. It, it's, uh, I like it. it. And it fitted as well. <laughs> I think there was I a like that one. Right here. Would you like a jelly baby? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a, a question before. It's not soaked in absinthe. <laughs> Jason Hagel, he was absent. I think he's taken to his bed. <laughs> saying it was saying it's flu, it wasn't, it was that jelly baby. <laughs> <laughs> he's never been sent to Thank you. <laughs> Actors, free food. It's <laughs> a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> Specifically, all yesterday you were talking about um, when you were about to start shooting for the, the movie we just watched. I think um, I think it was your agent talking about you know what you were getting into and stuff yeah. and how it's, that's kind of a stunning thing. Just like whoa, they're all crazy. But like, what would you say is more disappointing? Someone who has no idea who you are and doesn't really know any of your work, or somebody who's like obsessed with you and knows all of the stuff ever that you've ever done? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what they call a leading question? <laughs> so, but so, you have sort of answered it for me, haven't you? Um, I, should, uh, I should tell you, I mean, uh, we were talking yesterday that for those of you that weren't here, I'll, I'll, I'll try and praise it quickly. My agent came out to see us when we did the first week of the United States, tend to do that check, the gold taps of working in a five star hotel kind of thing. And she arrived. Um, but she and I had never had this conversation. That, this was Janet Fielding, who had played Tegan, of course, in, uh, in Doctor Who. We'd never, I knew she'd been an actor, I did, I did Tack and Twig. Uh, and when, and on the opening night, the first night shoot, there were some kids milling around on the set. And one of these kids approached her immediately and told her, as you do, every episode she'd ever been in, in water order and all that kind of thing. Anyway, so that's what she was referring to. So, the, so what was the leading question? Which is more disappointing? The question is, well, is it, I don't know, is it more of a shock, I guess, when they know everything you've ever done or when they have no idea who you are? You know what, I've got three brothers, all actors. Um, so m most often, they'll think I'm one of the others. Anyway. <laughs> it's happened for 30 years. I saw you in that thing. No, you didn't. <laughs> You were fantastic. Oh yeah, yeah, that was me. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't know. It happens despite you. It happens without you. I like it though. I like. You know why? Because it, it means you get to talk to people. <laughs> and I like talking to people. There you go. Fame. It was, it was a Ronnie Wood said. Everyone thinks it must be great to be famous. 
till they are. <laughs> Hello. You don't need a mic. Hello. <laughs> um, I was wondering what it felt like for you to wear that sort of clockwork orange type eye contraption. Of course, thank you. I hated it. Right? That went on for five, six hours, and he was just laughing at me all the way through. <laughs> no, it wasn't nice. Oh, come on, and then anything, you know, like total strangers like messing around in your face and with your eyes and stuff, it's, it's, it ain't nice. You know. It ain't nice. I hated it. Uh, that, that, that look was genuine. That look of panic. And of course, Eric was laughing at you, but he had to wear those contact lenses as well. That's true, man. It was karma. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think this gentleman had a question. Yeah. Well, Paul just covered it, but pretty much about the whole bridge. I'm one of the Wilderness fans. I've been watching this show since about 83, and it just disappeared one day, and I was wishing and hoping one day it would come back. And you guys, I want to thank all of you for bringing it back. Because we had about seven or eight years of that, seven or eight more years of that. Thank you. It's all for you. I saw it live when it aired. Thank you. All right, questions? Thank you, Bell. I saw you first. He was the audience. Hi, Hello. I have a non-Doctor Who question for Eric Roberts. Lost Girl, can you talk about that? Um, were you, is that a recurring role, a one-time role, or how were your approach to be um, considered for that position? I'm not supposed to say anything about it, but I'm going to say everything about it. <laughs> I plays Lost Girl's long lost dad, who shows up and goes, I've got more power than any of you guys, so don't mess with me. But I'm her dad. Come here, little girl. It's really a cool part. And, uh, and uh, I do all kinds of cool things. I, I, I'm held prisoner, but I can't be held prisoner because I can, I, I can, I can, I can just molecule myself and go places, you know? So, uh, it's a really fun part. It's almost a word. Um, I can add to that a little. I'm not sure where, it's, the whole season, final season, aired already in Canada. I'm not sure if it's finished here yet. I think it's not, right? Aren't we just... You know, it hasn't started here yet. No, no, it's started here. It's it shows what I know. <laughs> How many more do we have to go? One season behind. Okay. So, but I think we're on episode, I think episode six or something of, of season five just here. The way that it happened was actually kind of cool because we were up in Canada anyway in Toronto shooting suits. And we weren't supposed to say that Eric was on suits, but all of his fans were going, they knew we were in Toronto. Oh, you're in Toronto. I hope you're doing Lost Girl. And so that's what got to the producers of Lost Girl, believe it or not, and gave them the idea to use Eric. And so they asked his agent, can we meet with him? He, that was a mistake. They literally <laughs> were downstairs in our hotel at that time when they made that call. So the agent was like, sure, he'll be right down. <laughs> and then they said, you can't tell anybody that you're going to be doing Lost Girl. So now we're in Canada, and the two shows that are possible there. You can't talk about either of them. So we pretended we were on a nine-month vacation in Toronto for no reason. We love Canada. <laughs> we were visiting in January. <laughs> what you don't do. And I had a billion pictures in my phone that I had to wait to post, and then finally, when I, it was time to post them, I couldn't find them because I don't really know how to use my phone. No, whenever it snows, we come to Toronto. Right, exactly. So, um... <laughs> So it was very, you know, there's all these watermark scripts and this, this, you know. But it does, his role is interesting because it brings up the question about do we save the world by giving up on it because there's so much distress? Or in other words, it's good and evil and it's the good side of evil and the kind of bad side of good. Um, but I got to tell you, Anna Silk is the most wonderful lost girl herself girl and the fans of that show are like the fans of Doctor Who. I mean, they are... And again, another show we entered into, Heroes, Doctor Who, and that. Another show we entered into, Knowing Nothing. <laughs> and just got more confused as it went along. <laughs> but it was cool. Hi, 
Knights uh, of the Doctor was my favorite part of the 50th anniversary you know, propaganda. I was wondering how much you were being kept in the loop, you know, specifically Paul. How much you were being kept in the loop, what, what was going on in the 50th, what, whether you were offered anything more, uh, even, even a five second you know, blip in, 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 the, uh, in the actual 50th, that so would have been nice. But how much were you actually, uh, how much do you know was going on in the 50th? Well, the phone didn't ring, so I think it was safe to assume that uh, there was nothing. I mean, you know, when we made the, uh, the, that Five Doctors reboot thing, um, yeah, that was, that, I thought that was the best thing on that weekend, personally. But, um, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, that was, the, the whole idea of that was because we were just these sad guys that, you know, were waiting for the phones to <laughs> But while we were making that uh, Five Doctors thing, the phone rang. For me, of course, I couldn't tell them. So I felt terrible. But I was saved by Tom Baker, because he didn't tell him either that he was going to be there. <laughs> and this crime was a lot worse than mine, I didn't tell him. So I, I kind of got away with it. I was lucky. But uh, no, we had no idea. We had no idea at all. Um, that's how they work. That's how they work. It's cruel. It's an indifferent business. So. I, know. Um, I did have a question. I mean, are you following the new series all week? <laughs> Sorry, I'll jump next time. Hi, uh, yeah. I, I did have a question. Do you have any advice for the new cast? Um, if, uh, and advice and thoughts on having a movie actually come out of the new series? Um, they, obviously, you guys have been through a lot of scrutiny, plus and minus, so do you have any advice for them? For them? If it were to be an option. I don't know, I could I never feel I'm in a position to advise anyone. You know, but we, we did experience something kind of similar to what they're experiencing in terms of forging territory and wanting yeah. to honor it, right? So is there anything you'd say? Or maybe vacate, we'll just come back. It's like, get out of here. So, I, you know, we'll just, just you go back. Yeah, that. <laughs> That's the advice. Yeah. No, I, I can't advise anyone. I'm just making up as I go along. It's the best way to live, I think. That is a show, though, where I think that the producers, the studios, the networks, and the actors should pay attention to you guys. That's where the, that, the, the, all the riddles can be solved. I think that's something more and more. Um, I mean, aside from the, you know, the, just the marketing side of things, I think... Absolutely. You know, it's to the audience. Yeah, they should, and so they should be. You know, they, we make these things for you. You know, they're not made for... Right, for us. Yeah. Yeah. Wait for ourselves. There's no questions here. Where's our moderator? Right here. Oh, good. And there's some up here too later. Okay. Hello. I'm glad somebody's asked already uh, about something non Doctor Who specific because I've just had this one little thing that I've always wondered about ever since uh, the old Three Musketeers movie. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was in that. <laughs> They seem to make another one every five or ten years anyway, so I wasn't sure which one we were talking about. Well, to be honest, it, it was my favorite, but I've always, always wondered, did, did, did Gerard's voice hurt your voice? Was it a strain to get that false set up? No, man, I, I wake up feeling like that. <laughs> I just, I'm, just, I'm just lowering it now just for you. you know? <laughs> That's a, in fact, you know what, when I, I, I start work on Tuesday on this thing, Musketeers, I've got to go to Prague. Oh! Uh, you know, like, some of you may have seen it in the yeah. third series there. Um, so it's like, well, I didn't know what it's weird. It's going to be weird to be back <laughs> in that realm. But they keep making them, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> it's a story we all love. It's a story we all love. And we all know the end. <laughs> Play the doctor, don't you? you know that was a big rumor in '94 that it was going to be Rowan Atkinson who was going to play the doctor. So you know how close you are, my friend. Are you familiar with the Happy Days cartoon? No. It's well, it's about Fonzie and the gang traveling from time and space. Carry on. <laughs> Originally, Hamper Bear would try.